here. And uh, when I get excited about something, I hopefully I won't talk too fast, but I'm excited about what's on my heart. And hopefully it'll be an encouraging word to you. Uh, it is to me as well. Um, it was really interesting with the song selection and even just these words that were spoken just a few minutes ago, how it all ties in with what I'm going to talk about. And so I titled this talk, Eyes Wide Open. There is nothing new under the sun. I love that second last, I, I love the worship by the way, but that second last song, there was a, a, a little sentence in there, you see what I do not see. Really, that is the essence of this message. So, I'm going to be reading quite a bit of scripture, so I am going to be looking at my iPad. I apologize that, for that, but I don't have everything memorized yet. I'm going to begin with this in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to be reading a portion from 1, for, uh, chapter 1, 9 to 11, and also 3, 11 to 15, and I'm going to start with Ecclesiastes 3. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart, but even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I want you to keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. So I concluded that there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that his people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before, and what will happen in the future has happened before, because God makes the same things happen over and over again. And then we'll go back to Ecclesiastes 1. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. Just a little side note with what's happening in the world. I wonder what in 20 years or 50 years how history is going to describe what we're going through, interestingly. So, I've always been intrigued with World War II. Maybe because my father lived through it and his family uh, in Poland, Germany, and their stories are crazy. I've also been watching the last couple weeks the greatest events of World War II in color on Netflix. Has anybody been looking at that? Anyways, really, really interesting. And I've been learning things about World War II that I didn't know about. Uh, the one episode was all about the Japanese, and I, there's some facts I just didn't know. But what do we learn from history? Hopefully something. But I am going to tell you a couple stories of my, my family, of my dad. So one really interesting story is that my parents and their families were German, but they were living in Poland, and the borders at that time, well, for hundreds of years, were shifting. So they were Germans living in Poland, and World War II broke out. And my grandfather was conscripted to the Polish army. He was actually captured by the Germans. And to make a long story short, he said, hey, I'm German. So then he went and fought for the Germans. Pretty crazy, eh? And then, at the end of the war, my grandmother had no idea if she would even see my grandfather again because he had no communication whatsoever. And I don't know, I can't remember the t period of time, but it took a long, long time for them to get connected through the Red Cross. So it was a very, very happy ending, which is really, really cool. Um, my father, this is also an interesting thing, he um, was part of, was they had to flee from Poland to Germany and in a horse with horses and a covered wagon and he was the eldest at that time at 12 years old and that was pretty crazy for him to be kind of the head of the family escaping Germany. But once they got to Germany he was also conscripted to the Hitler Youth and an interesting 
thing is that my family and my dad had no idea what was actually happening in the war. They had no idea about what was happening with the Jews and the extermination. So it's just an interesting fact. A kind of funny story is that when the war, war was over, so my parents, or my dad did settle in Germany, and they were still teenagers and, you know, kind of crazy teenagers, they found some rounds of ammunition and they thought it'd be really funny to put it in the fire. They made a bonfire. <laughs> so, there's ammunition going off everywhere. And they're hiding behind trees and rocks so they wouldn't get hit. And the village people heard it and they thought the war had started again. So they got in a bit of trouble. <laughs> Anyways, those are just kind of side note stories. But war. War is war. There's always going to be some kind of wars. And, you know, currently, we're kind of in a war of sorts, aren't we? And we just have a Remembrance Day. And so this is kind of the wars of the past and, and you know, what um, some of our relatives, and even my father-in-law, served in the military. And we remember, and I, I believe Ken Gill, that's what he spoke on last week, is remembering. And, that's really important. What have we learned? Are our eyes wide open? So getting back to our current day, we are in a world war of sorts, where destruction of life and dreams and wealth and health and homes and relationships have occurred. And already, has, as Jesse has spoken, there has been great disappointment. There's been hurting hearts. There's been massive confusion. There's been dis disrespect and dishonor and discord and also division. In Job 10.22, it says, it is a land as dark as midnight, a land of gloom and confusion where even light is as dark as midnight. Not everybody is living in that place, but some of us are, and some of us have been, and I think it's important to recognize that. So have you felt confusion, disappointment, doom? Where is the truth in all this? Where is the light, and where is the love? I know that I have been questioning such things as, why? Why, God? Why Pete? Why this that's happening in the world? Why such confusion? Why such heartache? Why such division? Like why? I don't understand. I don't understand. Help me to understand because I am just not making sense of it. It's okay to question. It's okay to have that question. Why? And also, I don't understand. One of the things that I have been doing this year is reading through the Bible. And I have a, a, actually a really good program that I'm using. And it's been so interesting to see that unbelief and division is not new. It's not new. It is right from the beginning of time right to current days. It is all throughout scripture. So I'm not going to go through a lot of stories, but I, some things that I was reading this past week kind of were highlighted. And I'm currently in one of the books I'm reading is, is the book of John. And in chapter 9, it's the story of Jesus healing a blind man on the Sabbath day by putting mud on his eyes. So he healed a blind blind man, and he put mud in his eyes. Doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, some of the uh, the leaders were like they just couldn't make sense of this. How can an ordinary sinner, they actually call Jesus a sinner, do such miraculous signs? And it says in scripture there was deep division of opinion among them. Now opinion the. Uh, definition of that is a view or judgment formed about something not necessarily based on fact or knowledge. And then the blind man 
and his parents were questioned again and again. The fact was that the blind man was healed, but the Jewish leaders still refused to believe that the man had even been blind and now he could see. But this is what the blind man, or that he's no longer blind, but this is what he said. But I know this, I was blind and now I can see. So no earthly explanation for it, yet it still happened. And another interesting thing is what I discovered is that when we don't understand things, it's really easy to question, of course, that's what we do. But it's also easy to kind of scoff at things. And there's actually two scriptures in the New Testament that say exactly the same thing. Second Peter 2, 12 and Jude 10. It says they scoff at things they don't understand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're all guilty of that. And this isn't a heavy, this is just like a reality. This is a real talk. So when we don't understand, our beliefs and our faith can be really challenged to the core, can't it? Like really, really challenged. I know I have been challenged. I was just like, what the heck? Like what, what is what I believe really true? When I see all this stuff going on and don't understand and I see division and even division in the churches, it's like, do we not serve the same God? Like this is crazy. So when we are challenged to the core, this often and usually can lead to some sort of doubt, some sort of confusion, extreme disappointment, especially when someone dies, right? Extreme disappointment, offenses, misinformation, deception, disrespect, and silly behavior. And it really is all to protect ourselves. And we're, none of us are immune to this. None of us are. Wow, that's a really humbling thought, isn't it? So in 2 Peter 3.17, it says this, You already know these things, dear friends, so be on guard. Then you'll not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him both now and forever. Amen. And in the Amplified, that was a New Living um, translation. In the Amplified, it says this, Therefore, let me warn you, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, be on your guard, so you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men who distort doctrine and fall from your own steadfastness of mind, knowledge, truth, and faith but grow spiritually mature in the grace and knowledge of, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory, honor, majesty, splendor, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 says this, Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. When I was asking God about this very raw and hard and certain season, with so many different camps on many subjects, not just one, this is a scripture he gave me. Because I just couldn't understand, and you know what? I still don't fully understand. It has been a costly season, and it has been a season with much, much grief. So, there is nothing new under the sun, but this is what Jesus says. My love remains and needs to remain. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak of all the languages of earth and angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secrets, plans, and possessed all knowledge, which we all know we don't do, um, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. 
Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does, does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Can you imagine what the Christians were doing in World War II or other world, uh, wars? Wow. I don't, I don't know, but I just fit that in. I just, if they read the scripture, what were they thinking? What were they doing? Anyways, I'll continue. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, this is kind of what I'm going to focus on. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only a part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, when we see Jesus, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfect, imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. And then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Let love be your highest goal. So we only see in part. Yet, there are still facts we can't dispute, like the blind man that was healed. He was indeed healed. But how that came about, or how Jesus could, would heal others, and in other places he didn't do any miracles. We don't know. I work in healthcare. <laughs> there are facts and numbers that cannot be disputed, and yet there's things I still cannot explain. So what can we do to prevent any further discouragement? What can we do to prevent any further disunity or deception or disrespect or dishonor and disconnection? How can we reconnect? How can we renew our hope? How can we have unity? How can we have that faith, love, hope, and joy? How can we narrow all those gaps between not just us and other people, but more importantly, that gap between us and God? With eyes wide open, may we be reconnected. May we be reconnected with our Father. May we be reconnected with one another. So these are some of the practical points that I have here. Number one, humility is key in seeing correctly. Our eyes wide open. Webster's Dictionary states that humility is a quality or state of not thinking you are better than other people. In John 9 it says, Jesus told them, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they, they can see that are blind but they are blind. Some of the Pharisees who were standing nearby asked, are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus said, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Right? All about seeing, what are we seeing? Proverbs 11, 2 says this, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. We 100% need humility to see correctly, to have our eyes wide open. Secondly, I've already spoken about this, acknowledge that we only see in part. 
For some reason, maybe it's because God thought we got too proud. If we actually understand absolutely everything in this world, we don't. Number three, this is super important. Who is the enemy? Who is our enemy? Because when we're having our eyes wide open, we need to understand who the enemy really is. John 7:24 says this, look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. And John 10, 10, a lot of these verses are from John because I've been in John, but they're awesome. John 10, 10 says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, and I love this, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. We need to understand who our enemy is. That's what they did. If you read anything, watch anything on the wars, they had to understand their enemy. And some people are actually aren't our enemy. One of the things that I didn't realize when I was watching the series is in the Royal Air Force, there were those ace pilots, and an ace pilot, you became an ace pilot when you were able to shoot down five of the German planes and you became an ace. Now, not all of those ace pilots were actually British. There was Polish, there was South Africans, there was Czechoslovakians, but they all knew who their enemy was. So let's know who our enemy is, right? And we know that the devil is out to kill, steal, kill, and destroy at all times. At all times. Now, I'll just, I don't know if I, how much time I have here. I was going to tell you a prophetic dream that I had, or I call it a prophetic dream. Before we moved to Africa, I, I'm a dreamer. I dream all the time, every night. And a lot of those dreams, they're just dreams processing or pizza dreams or just I'm a dreamer. But every once in a while, I know that there is a dream that God is highlighting. And I still remember this dream. We were in my parents' house looking out to the acreage and out to where the barn was. And in my dream, I sensed and could see this very, very, very dark spirit. And I actually addressed it in my dream. I said, who are you? And it answered me, I am Adrian. That was the end of the dream. But I knew that it was just dark. And I thought, what is this? I need to know about it. And it took me a long time um, to figure it out. But we were actually, I moved to South Africa, and I had mentioned this dream to someone who was from the UK. And he said, oh, I knew what that is. That's in reference to Hadrian's Wall. And it just went, that's exactly what it is. So there was a guy, a Roman emperor called Hadrian, and AD 122, who built a wall dividing the country. It was 73 miles long in northern England to protect the Roman era, Empire. And what, what was really highlighted for me is that it's this division, this spirit of division, this spirit of disunity. And at that time, I actually thought it was just for me and some of my family members and some things going on, and that's kind of what it was highlighted. And uh, I don't know, a few months ago, that dream came back to me, and I just felt God say, this is a spirit of division that is in our world right now. And this is really what you're dreaming about. It's a real thing. Again, not to fear it, but know who your enemy is with your eyes wide open. Yeah. Number four, check your eyes. John already stole my thunder on this one. That's okay. I thank you for that. Just confirms. Matthew 7, 1, it says, Do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you are treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will judge. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own? Get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will be well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eyes. I don't know if anybody of you have had eye exams where they have discovered floaters or, um, I don't know, cataracts, or there's all sorts of things that can happen in the eye that can impede our vision. Unforgiveness is a huge one. Huge. Offense and unforgiveness. Pride, fear, 
the list can go on and on and on. Take the time, even when your heart is so sore, take the time to have an eye exam. Don't run away. Listen. Write it down. It's okay for emotions to come up. It's okay to have sadness. It's okay to be angry. But write it down. What kind of glasses do you have on? Are you wearing sunglasses? Are you wearing glasses that are scratched? Are you wearing the wrong prescription? Are you wearing rose-colored glasses? Because if you have red on your eyes, all you're going to see is red in every circumstance. Do an eye exam. Check your eyes, the eyes of your heart. John 12, 35 says, Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those in the darkness cannot see where they're going. Yeah, if it's dark or if we have you know, something covering our eyes, we can't see where we're going. Put your trust in the light while there's still time, and you will be children of the light. Then later in the chapter, it goes on, but despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people st still did not believe. So there is a connection between what our eyes are seeing and what is going on in our hearts. The carnage of war can cause us to see and hear different, can't it? Be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. And be kind to others. Recognize what's going on in your heart. Allow Jesus to heal that. He knows. He's been through it all. There's nothing new under the sun. Next one. Five. See that your foundations are firm. What are your foundations? Is Jesus your rock? Are you looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith? Do your foundations include loving God and your neighbors? In Matthew 22, it says, you must love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Wow. Everything is based on that. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. In John 13, 34, it says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I was so excited when I heard Jesse tell or announce your Christmas strategy in loving people. Giving out backpacks, caroling, making sandwiches. That's, if you don't know me that well, but this will be one of the things that you will know, will find out about me, that I love to do. I love it. I um, have been involved in, in the course of my life in many different Avenues. Well, being in Africa for six years and doing all sorts of things, working with street kids, working at a baby shelter, um, establishing a child sponsorship program. Um, it doesn't matter, but I just love it. And what I love about it is it opens my eyes. Last year um, in Edmonton, for oh, almost a year, my daughter and I were part of an organization that helped delivered food parcels for people in need in our city. Oh my goodness, was, were my eyes opened? Because we drove everywhere, and parts of Edmonton that were close to my house, I had no idea how impoverished, impoverished people were. I had no idea people in my own neighborhood were, that were suffering like that. Unbelievable. So I encourage you, highly encourage you to get involved. It's going to open your eyes. It's going to change your heart. And not only at this Christmas season, may this continue on in your church forever. You are being connected to your community. You are connecting people to Jesus in, the, in what you're doing.
And your title of your church is Life Connection. Life Connection, right? That was a side note. Six, love and respect. Let's listen with our eyes wide open. What are we listening to and what are we saying? We're going to be held accountable for our words, both good and bad. bad. That's Matthew 12. Are the things that we're repeating, are they actually true? I uh, had a massage this past week, and my massage therapist, we got on topics of all sorts of things, and she had said, did you hear that the FDA proved this? I said, no. And in healthcare, I usually hear about those things. She goes, yeah, somebody told me that. And she says, but I haven't looked it up yet. So I went home and looked it up. I was like, no, that's not true. Have you ever played the telephone game? You know what that is? Is that you're in a circle and you, you start a story and then you whisper it in someone's ear and then it goes on and on and on and on. And does it ever come back the same? No, it's quite hilarious. But the point is, we need to be careful what we're saying. What are we listening to? So listen with our eyes wide open. And bottom line in all of this is love and respect. Love and respecting people. That's so huge. And so, dear friends, while you're waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's in 2 Peter 3. Are our opinions... Are my opinions closing the door to someone's salvation? Ooh. Okay, let's flip back over to more positive things. So what Graydon was saying a couple weeks ago is seeing the opportunities, having our eyes wide open to giving and loving. And that really is the difference. If we are so found, founded on Jesus and what he has done, for us and what he wants to do in, in, in our neighbors' lives, in our co-workers' lives. He wants all men to be saved. Let us love. May we be known for people, Christians, by our love, right? First Timothy 2.3 says this. This is good and pleases our God who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, and he is Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And this is a message that God is giving to us at the right time. Jesus. He wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth and to reconcile. He is our reconciler. When things are so messed up and we don't understand, He is our reconciler. That is the key to navigating this life. He is our reconciler. Most of all, I'm writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to God as Derek was speaking about. Pray for all men with all forms of prayer and requests as you intercede with intense passion. And pray for every political leader and representative so that you would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives as we worship the awe-inspiring God with pure hearts. Praying with gratitude. God, you are so good. We come before you with humble hearts. We don't see everything. Help us to live lives that are full of respect and love. May our feet be on you, Jesus. And may our eyes be wide open to all the miracles that you have already done for us. This is a house of miracles. This is a house of miracles. Salvation, that is the greatest miracle ever. 
May we never forget that salvation, what Jesus has done for us. That is a miracle. And really, when it comes down to it, that, that should be enough. But there's more, because Jesus promised us a life that was full. He promised us a life that would be full. I had a, a Polish patient, an older lady this week, and uh, she said something to me. She was so grateful. And she's lived through war, World War, 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 war II, and all this. And she just had this big smile on her face. And she just said, thank you. Thank you for working with God to keep me alive. Wow. Thank you for working with God to keep me alive. Did you know that you are a miracle in someone's life? I pray that you have eyes to see that you, that miracles are happening all the time. And I know life gets crazy, don't get me wrong. Um, I just felt to tell the story of what happened to me just over a year ago. Um, work has been interesting and crazy and I tend to get really, I just go. And sometimes I don't have my eyes wide open and sometimes I eat too fast. I was at work and it was busy and uh, I started eating my lunch and I just kind of heated my lunch up and it was in a glass container and put it in the microwave and it was almost like the soup, kind of a butternut stew, I guess. So very soft, it was like a stew, you just, or a soup that, you know, was just swallowing. Didn't need to chew a lot, but I really wasn't chewing at all. Went home about three days later. It was a Thursday, and it was a Monday, so how many different days that is. I was at home, and I all of a sudden had intense pain. Like it felt like glass was inside of me. Guess what? Glass was inside of me. I had swallowed a piece of glass. And miraculously, absolutely miraculously, it did not cut anything all the way down. Except I did have to have a procedure to take it out. <laughs> but wow, wow. So the point of that is that there are miracles already happening and you just don't see them. They're in process like it's already been stated. There's miracles that are in progress. And I just pray, my prayer for you is that your eyes will be wide open. God is making everything beautiful for its own time. That's the verse I started with, and that's the verse I'm going to end with. God is making everything beautiful for its own time. There's one thing that remains, is that his love never fails. Are you drenched in his love? Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for each of these precious, precious people. I pray that we will, Holy Spirit, we will take the opportunity right now to examine our eyes and our hearts and, and not be afraid of what we see, whether it's sadness or whether it's anger or whether it's disappointment or whether it's jealousy or whether it's unforgiveness, but that we'll take time to, to acknowledge that and allow Jesus, you our healer, to come and to take our hearts in your hand and to, and to hear your voice that says, you may not understand, but I have your heart. I have your heart and I'm actually using you right now where you are. And I'm gonna heal you and I'm gonna do more miracles and you can't maybe see them right now. 
but I see. May we hear you, may we listen with eyes wide open, may we see with eyes wide open, may we know that you are God, you do not change. You do not change, and you're good. And you still have a purpose for this. Every person here, you have not forgotten. I pray that your peace that passes all understanding, all understanding, will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you, you are good. May we choose to rejoice in your goodness. May we choose to see you. May our eyes be fixed on you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And yes, it's hard at times. Yes, there's war at times. May we see you, may we listen, in Jesus' name. And may we go forth with excitement that you have it. We're in your hands, in Jesus' name.